Everyone said, amen, amen. Will you give our worship team a hand? We love giving honor to the Lord. That's one of our first things you know about our vision is honor God. With honor of God also comes honor of other people. And so I want to honor a few people. Of course, our worship team, thank you so much. I want to honor Earl for last week for preaching a great message. Aren't you glad we have such great preachers in this house? You're going to get to hear from pretty much all our elders. Some of them don't even know it. You're preaching this, this summer. Get ready. And it's going to be an exciting time here in the heart. One thing I love about hearing Pastor G, hearing Earl, my wife's preaching in a few weeks, Pastor G next week, is as a church, especially a multicultural church, we don't do cultural appropriation here. We don't do tokenism here. We do life together. And each one of us has a style and a way that is needed in the body of Christ. Which is why me as the lead pastor, I recognize I have a certain style of teaching. The way I teach is good. And it's going to minister to some, but others it might not minister to. And that's okay. You know why? Because God has blessed us with multiple people, with multiple gifts. And they get to come up and be themselves. They don't have to be like me or be like this person. They get to be themselves fully and proclaim to you the gospel in their way, and it hits differently for different people, and that's needed in the body of Christ. And that's valued as one of our values at City Life Church and in every nation is diversity. We believe in that. And so I want to thank Earl. I uh, want to thank our production, everybody back there, those of you online, those of you here. I want to thank, I don't remember, I don't know if it was Shawnee, Shaniqua, who did the chalk, chalk, who was it? Do you know? Don't know. One of our great artists, uh, when we start new sermon series, they always do an art piece on our chalk wall. Make sure you check it out. It's amazing the talent and the people that give their time, treasure, and talent to this house, and we're so thankful for that as well. We could go on and on, so I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you being here, sitting there with masks on, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Some of you might be more used to it. Some of you are just enduring and patient, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Way to go. And just want to honor you and say thank you for that. I'm with you as I'm singing and doing everything there, coming now, uh, getting to take it off. But we, we honor that. We appreciate that um, as we are a people that are doing our very best to be loving. Walk in faith and love together. They're not different. It's not a dichotomy. We're a holistic people, and we want to represent Jesus in that way. So thank you. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me as we get started today in Matthew chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. We have it on the screen. If you're online and you're watching, there are online Bibles, and you can watch it on the screen as well. This is a passage in Scripture where Jesus hasn't started his earthly ministry yet. At least in the traditional sense that we consider the three years where he had his disciples and he's doing miracles and he's teaching synagogues and he's going around and doing. We don't know a lot about Jesus as a kid. We have instances of him being born, of course. We see a glimpse of that. We see him at 12 years old as his rite of passage going to the temple. But beyond that, it's kind of like dark. The only thing we know is he's brilliant. Brilliant. The people in the temple, the Sadducees and the scribes, he was asking them questions, not questioning them, asking them questions that were amazing them at a 12, 12 years old. So this man was like prodigy, savant, amazing. We know this. But then it just goes dark. We don't know much more. Matthew picks up with Jesus as a 30-year-old man, roughly. And this is where John baptizes him. Read this with me. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. 
And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Open our ears as you say, let those who have ears, let them hear what you want to say. God, open the ears of our heart, our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting a new series. This is a five-week series called Life's Greatest Questions. There's a lot of questions we could ask, and that might be intriguing. What are life's greatest questions? Well, I'm going to give them all to you today. In thinking about the scripture, which we're going to get back to, and the words that were spoken, spoken over Jesus by his Father, how powerful those words were. This is my Son, whom I'm well pleased. In John 10.10, 10, John writes this gospel, this letter, and he includes something that Jesus says. He says, Jesus is talking about the enemy of our souls, the one that comes against us, this character called the Satan. He doesn't actually have a real name. The Satan means the adversary. The Bible doesn't even distinguish him for, with a real name, just an adjective. That's what God thinks about him. But there is a real enemy. And Jesus says this, this enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He says, but I've made a way. I've come to give life and life more abundantly or life to the fullness. This is what Jesus has come to establish. He says himself, I've come to seek and save the lost. I've come to give life and life to the fullness. I've come to not just tell you or give it to you, but to demonstrate it as well on this earth. As the Bible says, he had more joy than anybody that's ever walked on the face of the earth in the book of Hebrews. So there's something about Jesus that was astonishing to the people of the time. And as we read and know him and get to know him, we are astonished too. And not just to go, man, we're so thankful for Jesus. Yes, but also I want to walk like him. I want to follow him, which means do what he does and act like him. That doesn't mean you're going to be a God. We don't believe that. He is God. But because he's a God, he's the only one really worth following. And he's come to give us life and life to the fullness. Today I'm going to set some foundation work, so I'm not going to answer all the questions. I'm not going to really get to everything. We're going to be building this as we go and answer each question that we believe are life's greatest questions that we need to ask and answer personally. A lot of this is obviously coming from Scripture, but also two books that I've been studying. Number one that I encourage you to get. Dr. Kathy Cook is a Christian psychologist, works for a nonprofit called Celebrate Kids in Dallas, Texas. She wrote a book called Five to Thrive, and it's actually a sequel to a book she has written earlier. And she maps out these five questions and five core needs that each one of us need to answer and need to be fulfilled to have that abundant life. And we're going to talk about that. Another one is a great book by John Mark Comer, one of my favorite teachers, called Garden City. I highly recommend both of these books if you want a good read, if you want to get audible, listen to them while you're driving, while you're prayer walking around your neighborhood. Hashtag love your neighbor 2021. Shameless plug. I want to talk about out of this book. Dr. Kathy Cook, I actually met her. I was on, board, on a board of a nonprofit called Life Enrichment Center in Abilene, Texas. Got to meet her because we brought her in to teach some of our, to do some training, teach some of our teachers and some of our board about what she does and the way she frames in order to help kids, adults, people. And she frames from a very biblical point of view, but frames these five core needs that each one of us 
have, and each one has a question, and each one has a skill. I want to go over this again, laying some foundation, and then we're going to talk about this first need a little bit at the end. Number one, she says the first core need of every person is security. With this question, who do I trust? This idea of security, and the order matters here, she would argue, because... The first question that is answered, the first thing as you're growing up in life with your parents or trying to find friends is, who do I trust? You need to be able to answer this as a core need. You need to have somebody that you can trust. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. No such thing because someone paved some kind of way for you to do it. You might say, no, I did everything. Okay, you made those roads that got you to work. You built that car by your hand to get you to the place. No, you did not. You actually made that organization or the patent laws in order to have your entrepreneurial spirit and build your thing at Shark Tank. Dun, 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 dun. You did that? No, you are not self-made. You had to trust someone along the way in the midst of. The rain clouds of a lot of mistrust in our world, right? But she would argue this is one of the first things we need. And one of the problems with this first one, and really all of them, is we have counterfeit ways that we answer these questions that we're going to look at. Let's go through all of them. Security, who do I trust? The next one, identity, who am I? We're all asking this question especially as you're young and coming of age and trying to figure out who am I? What, what do I believe? What am I about? The next one is belonging. Who wants me? Life's greatest questions. Who wants me? Where do I belong? Who's my people or my tribe or my best friend? We all need those social atmospheres and constructs within the concept of our life so that we can display Our gifts so that we can, the next one, find our purpose, which is the question, why am I alive? Why am I even here? What am I doing with my life? When you don't have this one, you live really purposeless, hopeless. Wake up in the morning, you're going, I don't have a reason to get out of bed. I don't know my purpose. Why am I alive? I don't know. And this needs to be answered. The last one. Dr. Kathy would argue, I think argue well in her book, is competence. What do I do well? Now, notice I've put them in a sort of a pyramid because in her book she says, and from a framework biblically, I think this is super helpful, that there is an importance of each one. Now, each one is a need. It's a core need. So you need each one of these But the way and the order that you answer these questions is very, very important. I'll give you an example. I would would argue most of us start with actually the wrong question and the wrong core need in our life. Competence. What do I do well? You grow up. Your parents put you through sports, everything, trying to figure out what you can do, which isn't a bad thing because that's a core need. But It becomes a problem if you are just focused your whole life, your whole identity around this main thing. This would, the scripture would call, an idol. Something you love, serve, or act upon more than God is an idol. It could be a bad thing, which we know a lot of bad idols, addictions. It could be a really good thing. What do I do well? Most of us start like this, even when we meet each other. What do you do? What do you do? Now, men usually ask that question, what do you do for a living? Because it does help us give kind of a framework to know where to go from there. It's not a bad question, and that's pretty normal because our culture is about what you do. If you don't produce, if you don't do something, you are nobody in our culture. Now, if you answer this question like most people do, think about yourself as a kid. Maybe think about yourself now. I'll give you a couple examples, and I'll then, one of our values in every nation and and City Life Church, I should say, is authenticity. I'm going to be authentic today. You ready? 
probably never heard a pastor be authentic. Here we go. What do I do well? You remember that athlete, or maybe you were that athlete growing up, star basketball player, football player, track, wrestler, whatever it was. Maybe you were into art. Maybe you were straight A student all the way through. If you didn't, your parents were going to kill you. So your answer would be, what do I do well? Man, I play basketball. I'm an athlete. I get straight A's. For me, if I start with this question in determining my life and my core needs, I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. I pastor people. This is what I do. And most of us build to the next one. Okay, then, why am I alive? What's my purpose? See, because what I do determines why I'm alive. Okay, well, uh, if I'm a basketball player, I, I, I play basketball. You fill in your own blank. Straight A student, I excel academically. This is why I'm alive. I'm alive to excel, to be the best, to have the best grades, to graduate with highest honors. For me, if, if my identity is wrapped up first in my competence, what do I do well? I take care of and feed the people the scriptures. Now, these aren't bad answers. In fact, they are good answers. But just bad foundations. Let's keep going. Belonging. If these are your answers, who wants me? Well, who wants me? Uh, an athlete, my coach, my teammates, my fans want me. Man, I got all these YouTube clips. I, I'm, I'm going up. This is how I'm getting out of my circumstance. Who wants me? My school, my, my parents, my job wants me. If I'm seeking academics, and that's my identity wrapped up in my competency. Again, that's not bad. You should say my parents want me, my coach. That's okay, but when it's primary, something's going to crumble eventually. Let's go to the next one. How do I answer my identity? Okay, well then, who am I? Like, I've established enough, and I've answered these questions within my life based on my competency. I'm an athlete. I am a basketball player. I am an A student. That's who I am. That's my identity. I am intelligent. Maybe for me, I am a pastor. I am a shepherd. That's what I am. And then finally, because we started with a what, it's not who do I trust, but what do I trust? Not a who, not a person anymore, but a thing, typically. And this is how most people respond. If I'm an athlete, what do I trust? My ability to play basketball, my gifts. If I seek straight A's, my ability to learn and excel academically, that's who I trust. That's what I trust. If I'm a pastor, I trust my communication, my ability to be, deliver a message to you in leadership. But what happens if you're an athlete and you tear your, tear your ACL beyond repair? Who am I? I'm a former athlete. I don't know who I am now. My life was built around my competency. My competency is important. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We're going to do a whole message on it and why it's important for the kingdom of God to know what you do well and to work really hard. But if I build my life on that rock, it will shatter. And you know it. You've probably experienced it. I know I have. Let me be real. If I build my life I, what, with what I do, I am a pastor. What happens when I say my identity is wrapped up in how well I communicate? My security is based on my communication. What happens when someone leaves the church or gets mad or gets angry because of something you said? I am a failed pastor. I have failed based on my competency, which, by the way, I'm going to do because I'm not a savior. I don't have a red phone to Jesus more than you. We have the same Holy Spirit. There's just different gifts and different parts of the body. I might be a mouth to speak the word, but you could be a hand, maybe a heartbeat. And we're all needed in the kingdom of God. Do not worship a pastor 
But pastors like to be worshipped when they build their life on what they do. Because they have to be worshipped or they crumble. I have to hear amen. I have to see a smile. I have to get a laugh because I have to know I'm communicating well and I'm doing my job well. How I answer life's greatest questions will show me my idols, will show me who I really worship, and will either make strong foundations in me or break me completely. Let's go back to the athlete. I'm a basketball player. I'm a football player. You know those guys now. They're schoolyard legends. Playing ball. Boys and Girls Club. I mean, play. Go. YMCA. Play. Don't make that your life. Don't make that your rock. It's not worth it. I'll tell you, I'm 41. Things, gravity takes over. It just doesn't work. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. That doesn't mean it's not a core need, your competency. But if you make it your everything, you are setting yourself up for failure. And this is why Jesus came. In America, it's so popular to be known for your clicks, for your subscriptions, to be known for your celebrity, for what you do really well that's so unique from everybody else. But then comparisonism gets in. And when comparison happens, it is a robber, it is a destroyer, it is a stealer of joy. Because I'm never going to be good enough. There's always someone with more clicks. There's always someone that's a better teacher. There's always someone that's a better athlete. There's always someone that's a better straight-A student. And now my goal isn't to glorify God and be the best me I can be. I've got to be a better you than you. This it's why these are life's greatest questions, and the order and the answer matters to what Jesus says. The enemy comes to steal, to, to kill, to destroy, and he does it from the inside, and he uses your own proclivities and your movements and your shifts and your adaptability, and he knows how to do it where it's just blurred the lines enough. Next thing you know, it's leading to your death, and he says, I've come to give you life, peace. We need peace. We need life. So, let's talk about the answers to these questions. And I'm going to give you some things Dr. Kathy Cook says, and then as well as scriptures, because that's the backbone of who we are. Security. Who can I trust? How do we answer this? I can trust God, He does not lie. His word is true. He is always able and available to help. And he forgives me and loves me no matter what. Romans 8, 31 through 32 and verse 38 says this. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And everyone said, that's where you say amen, by the way. Paul gets really excited because he's not just writing something, but he's believing and passing on that faith and that encouragement, that truth to people. This is the right answer. Identity. If that's true, if I trust in the Lord, if I make him my rock, my foundation, my refuge, I run to, he is number one. He is, this is what we talk about, being Christ-centered. Everything is centered around him. He is how I answer this first question. Now, who am I? I'm someone God loves whom Jesus Christ died for. John 1, 11 through 13 says, He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. You ever walked into a room and no one cared? Imagine creating all those people and no one cares. But to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who am I? Someone God loves, whom Jesus Christ died for. Okay, then who wants me? My belonging. Because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I belong to God. He wants me because of who he is, not because of what I do. That's the gospel. He doesn't say, you have to be this tall to ride this ride. You have to do all these things in order to get into my presence. He says, I will do it for you, and now you can. Romans 5, 7 through 8, I love this scripture. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's a common theme in our society today, get get away from all these toxic people. There's no one more toxic than you to God. Are there people in your life you should probably remove yourself from? Sure. That's why we need wisdom. But there are also people God might have put in your life that are toxic in order for you to help be a semblance of him to them the way God is to you. Remove yourself from all toxicity, and you too have to die. This is why Christ came. You hear in apologetics, people say, why would God not just get rid of all evil? He sees it. He has the power. He can get rid of all evil. And the answer is because if he did, he would have to get rid of you too. And yet, while we were toxic, while we were sinners, Christ died. Where's my excuse again to not go that extra mile? To not extend the forgiveness because healed people heal people. Forgiven people forgive people. And I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying roll over. But I am saying go to God. And when he's your source, he gives you power beyond yourself to do things beyond yourself. Now the answer, purpose, why am I alive? Then I'm alive to glorify God through whom? I am and through what I do. Keys to this are becoming more like Christ through a relationship with him. Loving God well, loving my neighbor as myself. Spreading the good news of the gospel and helping Christians mature in their faith. Why am I alive? What's my purpose? To bring glory to God. To make his words and his life more weighty than everybody else around me. And you talk about a life of peace. Not of ease but of peace. How you answer these. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Paul's just like, look, everything. Do all to the glory of God. You know why this is so powerful? Because we divide secular and sacred. This is my secular life and this is my, and Jesus comes on the scene and says, listen, it's all spiritual. You don't have a spiritual life and then a regular life. He brings this holistic mindset, the way you think, the way you act, what you do, what you say. It all matters because you are a holistic being in need of a holistic saving. In fact, that's what the word save means, completely holy, healed, and saved. Spirit, soul, body, every bit of you. So Paul says, listen, you can go to work and glorify God. If he's your number one, if you answer according to this. The last one, competency. What do you do well? What do I do well? When I've built my life on God as the rock and trusted in him and not myself or man, primarily, I could do anything well God asked me to do with his strength, power, energy, love, and wisdom working in me through the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 12, 13. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's good to read that in context. Because Paul is very strong on the idea of my circumstances don't define me. My God does. 
That's the secret. He's the one that strengthens me. Now, here's the question as we end, and I'm going to give you some homework. Are you excited? You come to church for homework. But isn't that what it's about? People argue, ah, I just don't like the church. We can't just one hour a week. Well, that's true, so take something home with you. Learn, grow, get in community, and work on the things that we're talking about with the Lord as you go. Sounds like church to me. Who do you trust? That's the question. Who do you trust? How do you answer this question? Now, I just gave you all the answers. Do you remember in, in, in math, like your junior high? Math was one of my favorite subjects in junior high. Once you get to high school and like my son's learning pre-algebra and pre-calculus and not pre-algebra, pre-calculus and all this stuff. It's not, it's not so fun. And he's like, why do I need this? Yeah, I'm not going to be an engineer. Exactly. I know, bud. I get it. I get it. I know. I get it. But one cool thing is, especially in junior high, all the answers, or at least the odd answers, were in the back of the book. <laughs> so you're guaranteed a 50, unless you're just really dense. I mean, that was me. My freshman year in college, I took a computer class, and I didn't realize there was a CD-ROM, this is dating me, in the back of the book until the last day of school. And I was like, oh, that would have helped because I failed that class. Obviously, I didn't open my book very much. That's your intellectual pastor. In the back of the book are the answers. I just gave you the answers. But see, a good teacher doesn't just want the answers. They want, how did you discover those answers? I want you to understand how you get to them. Amen. So it's not enough just to be able to say, well, I trust God. In fact, a lot of church people do that. And it's inauthentic. How are you doing? Bless God. I'm more blessed than before. God blesses all this mess and all of the other little things that I say. But on the inside, you're really struggling. You have addictions. You have problems that you don't want to tell anybody about. Because if you actually were authentic for a second, you might be healed, but you'd be exposed. That's, that's a lot of people's experience at church. And this is why, let me tell you, who do you trust is a huge question. And not just answering like, well, I trust God. Well, do you really? Because if you do put your full trust in God, he will push you to put some trust in men and women and some level of authority. Because he is a God of order and he delegates certain authority. But see, the reason why we don't trust, if I was the enemy, what I would do is I would break your family apart and start with your mom and your dad. So you grow up and you go, how do I, tr I can't even trust these people. Why would I trust any authority? Why would I trust anybody? Why would I do anything? And the enemy knows how to get that mistrust in your heart to where now you look at everybody with suspicion and mistrust. If you really trust God, and I'll say it this way, and I've said it before. In scriptures, Jesus said he would not entrust his heart to man because he knew what was in man's heart. And a lot of people go, yeah, you can't trust people. That's not what he's saying. He had to trust people. He died, he left, and he said, y'all go build the church with my spirit, like I'm entrusting this message to you. He had some kind of trust, but there's a difference between entrusting, which is your full trust, and then just trusting. And when you fully do trust God, he doesn't, again, just make you a mat to roll over and just trust everybody. You still need wisdom. You still need his guidance. There are people that are out to get you, but you've got to be really careful that you don't look at everybody with mistrust and suspicion. In any kind of communication, in any relationship with your spouse, with your best friend, Andy Stanley, I love what he says, there are gaps of information that you don't have. Somebody showed up late for work, and you have these gaps. I don't know why they're late. I don't know what's going on. They come in disheveled. I do not know. I now either insert into that gap by faith, trust, or suspicion. Either way. If I entrust my heart to Jesus, it actually gives me the ability to insert trust. Well, maybe they broke down. Maybe something bad happened. Maybe. And so now I'm approaching them going, hey, are you okay? Hey, what's going on? And if they now say, oh, it's just, uh, I'm late, and they have all these excuses, now I confront them with truth, but I start with trust. Because if they 
mistrust, it doesn't break my heart. My heart is in Christ. I actually am whole and at peace, not based on you or you or you. Let me tell you, as a pastor, you want to talk about church hurt. I've been doing this 20 years. I got a lot of church hurt. I know a lot of you guys do too. You've been in church, someone lets you down. We ain't exempt from that. I've given my life to minister to people, couples that cheated. One person cheated on the other person, and they call me, and I'm there, and I'm talking to them. I'm ministering, crying with them. And two years later, they go, you know what? This church doesn't have enough faith because you're requiring masks. I'm out of here. And you go, I just gave you a lot of my time. That's the deal breaker? What do I do in that moment? You know, see, it would be easy for me to then see a new person come in and go, I don't know if I could trust that person. But see, the Spirit of God says, Chris, who do you trust? I trust you, Jesus. Then you look at that person and you believe the best in them. And you, like me, I've got scars too, Chris. Jesus told me recently, i got scars too. Look at my side. Look but I did it for my father. I did it because I trust in my God. At any moment, I could have ripped off that cross and said, forget you and forget you and forget you. But I chose to stay, to heal you and heal you and heal you and give you an opportunity to experience grace when you don't deserve it because isn't that the story of my life and the way that he made for me? See, I choose because I put my faith and my security and my trust in Jesus first to now trust as you walk in this door that God's doing something in your life. I want to believe the best in you, that God has something. Not that you're perfect and I'm let down when you're not. I know you're not, and I'm not either. We need Jesus. And when we truly trust in him, how you answer this, you will start to love other people as well. Because you trust in his authority, you trust in his word, and ultimately his love. I'm closing by saying this, Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is so trustworthy. I get, I do 100% get people that say, I hate God. I don't want to have anything to do with God. I understand that. You know why? Because if my mentality of God is that he's just up there and I'm suffering and at any moment he could snap his fingers and take away all my suffering. I'm not interested in that kind of God. That's a horrible God. But what if that God decided to come down and suffer and die and endure pain and cross and suffering far beyond what I could so that I could experience victory even in suffering, peace even in turmoil? That's a God. You got my life. I trust you because you know everything I've been through and you've been through more. That's a God I trust. Who do you trust? We're going to take a moment and if you'd like, grab your communion. And I'm here to tell you communion is a great time to examine your heart, who you trust. But here's the deal. Often we say, examine your heart, and if you're not taking this right, don't take it. That is not what the Bible preaches. In fact, those of you that go, I'm examining my heart, I don't deserve to take this, you need to take it. That's what it's for, because you didn't deserve it, and Christ died. And I'm taking this saying, I trust in you. And I'm watching someone else take it, I'm saying, seeing they trust in you. This is our opportunity to take the bread, to take the wine during our worship time at your own convenience together. Father, we honor you. Let us trust more in you than in ourselves, than other people, than our things. Change us from the inside out so that we can love and walk in peace. In Jesus' name.